Veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Football. Oh, you know, sometimes I hate when the Vikings play on Monday because you have to wait so long for the game and you get a, you get up on Sunday and everyone's all excited to watch football and, and then Sunday gets done and then Monday, you wake up Monday. Okay. I still have to wait till Monday night to watch the Vikings. But yesterday might've been a top five all time red zone day. Oh my God. How great was that entire day? I I mean, first of all, it all starts with, because, you know, for the first week I I was at uh, the Packers-Vikings game, but it all starts with your old friend, your old pal. It's like a long-lost friend. Scotty Hansen comes back. You know, I'm not by choice. I get Siciliano. Oh, no. Because I run it through the, the what you would call it, the direct TV package. Oh. Because I, I have the, I have purchased the streaming package. Oh, no, you got to have, you got to have my and guys got it. that is an impossible job. And Andrew Siciliano is, listen, like, there's not that many guys that can even attack that job. No. But let true. me just say, there's only one Scott Hansen. There really is. There really is. I, and, I mean, it's just fantastic. But, yes, you are right. As far as a... Red Zone was designed for this day. Yesterday was it. Phenomenal. And I'll tell you, I was I was bouncing around. We were uh, we were bouncing around to some of the some of the bars in the neighborhood here, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Two of the bar, we went to like three or four different places. A little snack here, a little drink there, whatever. We will get some steps in, and uh, two of the four places we went mm-hmm. had Red Zone. Oh, nice. And that is, I feel like if you're a bar, and Judd and I have talked about this as a side consulting gig, how many times do you go into a bar and they've got the wrong channel on or they, they don't have, you know, okay, it's it's noon central time now and it's time for football games to be on and no one's paying attention. Then you have to ask the bartender. I went to a bar one time like 10 years ago in Denver. I think it was Peyton Manning's first year with the Broncos. Mm-hmm. And we were on vacation during Vikings bye week. And uh, we walked into some dive bar 30 minutes from Denver, like out toward, like past Boulder, some, somewhere out in the Bahoonies. And this bar had like 20 different TVs. All of them had laminated, laminated, printed and laminated yes. guides taped on the bottom of the TV showing you what game is going to be on at what time. At noon, this game is going to be on. And then at, you know, whatever, 3 o'clock, whatever the hell time it would be in Denver. So you know what? That is a bar that gets it. So oh, they, yeah. they they have a bar TV like a, t- a football TV bar game coordinator guy that goes around yeah. before my, everyone gets in and that's my job. Prints I want and that laminates job. sheets. I want that job. That's the <laughs> look. If you have a sports bar, if if you have a respectable sports bar with you know tons of TVs, you should run it like a sports book. Like your TV approach should be, you should go to a sports book and find full-time out what's their One person's full time job. Yes, exactly. Benefits. Right. Yep, everything. And I'm talking about for all sports. Now, now, football is the creme de la creme, but I'm talking about for all sports. You should have, like, you should never have a TV that's gone dormant. No, you know, and, a TV uh, with, oh, there, there's a Cheers rerun on because the game ended. No, no, that can, that can go. I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't know if this Twitter account still operates. And by the way, we will get to statements, NFL-related statements uh, later in the show. The wild wild training camp oh, is starting here. We are we are moving past largely the Minnesota Twins, who just got their asses kicked in the first three games. Well, there was a couple close games, but the season's pretty much over. Um, but I would add this to the, to the TV. What are we calling this position, by the way? Uh, TV game day coordinator? Manager? Where's- Director? President, president of sports TV operations. I yeah. want a president's title. Damn it. PS like TVO. <laughs> okay. The, the, the PS TVO of, of the bars. All right. Um, I, there used to be a Twitter account called like bananas, like sports bananas or something. Mm-hmm. And it would tweet. I don't know who ran this, but it would tweet out any time of day or night. If there was even like a random college basketball game inside two minutes, tie game, Oh my God, bananas on ESPNU right now! You got you, everyone. You got to turn the channel. To, like CBS Sports Network right now. There's an Atlantic Ten game that's coming down to the wire. Turn your channels to CBS Sports Network. You need that hype guy in the bar. Okay, guys, guys. Hey, yep. uh, I need CBS Sports Network up here. Everyone, there's 30 seconds left. Yep. There's there the the 
<laughs> Dayton Flyers are out of timeouts. You let's watch what happens. Who wants I, another round? I love this. Here, here's the key: put a red light above each TV, and if there's a bananas game, <laughs> Whoa. it goes off. <laughs> you got to go to TV 34. TV 34. It's unbelievable. That's a. I love over here. that oh, idea. Oh, on the end of the bar, this TV over here. I love. That's a great <laughs> idea. You oh just my need to clone God. John Taffer and just put him in numerous bars like this. Like you, you gotta get red zone on. This is a disgrace. No one yeah. wants to watch the Jets and Browns. You know, you know they, they, they want to watch something. Every time my wife and I walk into a bar, we're all, we always make some John comment Taffer. about like, what would John Taffer say about this say over here? Thing. Ooh, it looks yeah, like he yeah. just looks like the bartender slid a free drink to a friend mm -hmm. there. Are you running a business or are you running a place to hang out with your friends? Coming up next on Bar Rescue. All right, let's start with uh, Judd Zolgad here. NFL statements from a glorious red zone Sunday. All right. Uh, my first my first. A statement is not about a game that was close, but a situation that I think provided clarity. And I will say this. My statement is the NFC became tougher on Sunday, which, of course, involves for the Vikings. Trey Lance's injury, while sad for, tr for Trey and his friends and family, makes the 49ers a better team. Jimmy Garoppolo is a better quarterback right now. Now, Trey Lance might have been fine. I don't know. But if you saw Garoppolo and, and how his teammates reacted to him once he came in th that game, and the fact that he is a known quantity, and the fact that he is a very, very competent, I don't know that he's a Super Bowl winning QB, as he proved, but he's a very competent QB. And I think with Trey Lance, there were a lot of questions. With Garoppolo, there's a lot of knowns. I would say the San Francisco 49ers became a bigger contender for 2022 in the NFC on Sunday because of Trey Lance's season-ending injury. I just want to point out that insincere Judd making an early yes. appearance here 10 minutes into uh, the week of shows. Yeah, friends. I'm sure you do. No, you don't. I feel, I no, feel you bad don't. for him. As a human, I feel bad for him. As a football fan, yeah, you know what? He's been replaced by a better quarterback. It right is now. sad. I mean, he the, guy, the guy's barely played football since even college. He's played right. like a season yep. and a small handful of games. And, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think right now maybe he has a higher ceiling, and maybe once they mm -hmm. kick that Garoppolo contract, they've got $27 million extra dollars to spend on other players. So maybe the formula would have worked better long-term with Trey Lance. But, yeah, the, ni the Niners kind of went from, hmm, what are they? They just lost to the Bears in week one? I don't know, to, oh, okay, that team's probably winning 11 or 10, maybe 11 games when it's all said and done. Uh, all right, my first statement... <laughs> The Lions are no longer a pushover. So they beat the Commanders 36 to 27, and the Vikings will have to start scouting the Lions after they play the Eagles tonight. So we're not going to, we'll do the whole Lions Vikings thing later in the week, mostly on Purple Daily. But the Lions are already staring at the Vikings because that's their next opponent this coming Sunday. The last four games for the Lions dating back to last season, they're averaging 34 points per game offensively. Over their last eight games, the Lions are 4-4, four and four, including a win over the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Jared Goff, over his last seven games, 17 touchdowns, three interceptions, a 105 passer rating, and 65% completions. He's starting to look, if you go back to the end of last season and then the first two games this year, he's starting to look a lot more like the guy that peaked under Sean McVay in like years two and three for him. Small sample sizes. I think there was a game against Packer backups at one point, maybe in uh, week 18 last year. Um, but the Lions, they're, they're regularly putting up 30-plus points. Their defense is kind of a sieve. Yes. And and that is no longer just – and nor was it last year. The Vikings almost lost it twice to the Lions last year. But it's no longer a game on your schedule where you're like, Whew, all right, exhale, the Lions are coming to town, or vice versa. Um, they look pretty they, – they're fighting, and they look pretty impressive. They're a fun team now. But yes, I, I think they're I think the Vikings can score a ton of points. Detroit can now score though. And at least they mm -hmm. are at, at least they're fun to watch. Like how many games have or years have we been like, oh, red zone's going to the Lions, stop it. Now the I, now, I love it now. It's great. The break for the Vikings is this the Bears do suck. So I feel like for 2022, the Bears are basically playing the role of D Detroit. So it does help. 
But I mean that Bears. And Detroit's team, kind of playing the role of the Bears. We're like, yeah, they're not terrible, but they're not a they're not a pushover. You know, they might win six or seven games or something. They're fun there to watch. A, there was an epic rant. I think Kyle Brandt on Good Morning Football today talking about can we please stop the Packers and Bears rivalry in prime time game? Like it, it's just <laughs> oh, an I like that, dude. It's been an ass kicking right. for 20 years. Even with right. Favre, with Rodgers, the margin of victory with Rodgers is like 16 points. The margin of victory with Favre is like 14 points. It has not been a rivalry. It, it has been completely one-sided. And we get it every year. We always get Bears and Packers either on You're Sunday right. or Monday night every single year. And yes, it was a <laughs> gong show. It was just the Packers and Aaron Jones running up the score. Yeah, Don't I'm trying to pull it. So I, I'm pretty sure... I saw yesterday on the game, it was like, including playoffs, Rodgers is 23-5 and five against the yeah. Bears in his career. I own you. But he's, and, and, he, own you. And, he, and he does, yes. And he's right because the Bears, for the most part, just stink. And now they are epically bad. Like yeah. this yeah. team now. They, they're bad. The, the rain in Chicago in week one against San Fran was an absolute gift. Yes. Without that, they don't win that game. They are <laughs> epically bad. Uh, all right, Declan. All right, my first statement. I'm going to disagree with uh, Judd here. Uh, my statement is is that there is not a team in the NFC that looked has looked definitively better than the Vikings through the first two weeks. Uh? No one in week two was that surprisingly good to me. No one in week one really stood out outside the Vikes. The Bucks, to me, even though 2-0, and seem like a ticking time bomb, man. I mean, it just, it's ugly. Brady is frustrated. There's he's very personal stressed. things. Yeah. He looks like he's, he's as skinny. skinny as I am right his now. Like, there's something guts. wrong. That's yeah, his wife hates so, him. I'm so team Zell on this, by the way. What has, so what what's all is is it that she she basically said all right dude if you're just gonna keep playing I'm done putting my life and career on pause so I'm gonna go do some of this stuff you figure out what to do with the kids peace out is that kind of what's happening I I don't think it's it's more of the first part right like she's sacrificed all this stuff and she's done all these things for her kids and for the family too I should say and now Brady was gonna enter retirement and then he was like ah not so fast I want to come back and she's pissed off about that what is what is he doing. Because he, so yeah, so he, there's, there's nothing, the only thing that can happen on the field for him, like winning another Super Bowl is not going to, people aren't going to be like, oh, okay, all right, now he's the greatest quarterback of all time. I just need to see that one more Super Bowl with Tampa. He's already, he already won. He's already the greatest quarterback of all time. Yep. He is sitting on, whenever he wants to pull the trigger on it, a 10 year, like 350, 400, what is it, like a $400 million contract with Fox yep. to just jump right into his next career and be a dominant broadcaster? And he's had this, and I don't know, we don't know her behind the scenes, but this amazingly supportive wife that has kind of put her career on pause, and she's yeah. beautiful, and she's a great mom, it would seem, and all these things. Right, but he cool. needs one more bite at the apple in the NFL. Yeah. Like, what, dude. He can't give really? it up. Yeah. He can't give it, it up. But at it's, the at, to sacrifice your your marriage over this, I, at, I can see if you're 32, it's like, hey, listen, I can only do this for a certain amount of time. This just needs to be done. He's like 45. It, it it's not the same as the 2010 Vikings. I don't think their roof is going to collapse, and I don't think their quarterback's going to be knocked unconscious on the field by the end of the season. But it just it feels like that Bucks team is collapsing. And just looking around the NFC, I know the Rams and Falcons. It looked a little closer, and there's a little more flukiness in my opinion. And that was the Falcons coming back. Um, but the Niners getting Jimmy G, like, yes, Jimmy G is better than Trey Lance right now, and there's a lot more knowns. But I don't look at just swapping Jimmy Garoppolo for Trey Lance, and all of a sudden I'm scared of San Francisco either. So obviously the Vikings still have to play on Monday Night Football, but I don't see a team in the NFC that is definitively better than the Vikings. Or looks they, more they impressive. Need, they need the to Vikings. win tonight to to really validate that take because the other teams have played two games and they've played one, but like, yeah, there's not, there doesn't we, seem to be a front runner right now. And we probably need two months like, like because teams are going to change and morph and improve. So, so like I, I don't make that statement about how things are actually playing out with teams until November, probably because it changes so much with, within the first two months and teams find find identities and or lose them as well i would say this you you can definitely make the statement but if you would have made the statement a year ago or you know even like eight weeks into last season the cardinals would have been on your list of Ooh, sure. look out for this team yeah. i think it's what does the team look like in november and december and who is ascending and 
Yeah, but like step one is put yourself in a position sure. to be among those teams yeah. in November, and and you got to win games like this to make that happen. So. All right, now the fun yeah. stuff. Now the fun stuff, because I saw a lot of football, and some of it was gloriously entertaining at the end, but some of it was absolutely terrible, and it's helping me gain what I like to call clarity with coaching jobs. And I just want to go to Denver and say this. Nathaniel <laughs> Hackett ain't going to survive. Five, four, four three, the Royal Rumble. two, two one. one. <laughs> it's Unbelievable. Lester. Russell Wilson the had to be... Own, his own fans are mocking him in game two. And and he deserved it. He is not he is not going to make it. He is a human train wreck. I don't know. I'm trying to think of the last coach I saw who was this unprepared to be a head coach. It's Childress, insulting. Yeah. Childress in year one had some blips for sure, but I don't think it was I don't remember the last guy who essentially could not get plays in on time manage the clock period like he he doesn't check one box for coaching 101 in a pop warner league <laughs> i i am starting to wonder if he's going to make the entire season it is a disaster and russell wilson is his quarterback so it's not like it's it's um it's you know some young qb who's screwing up and he can't process it like, this is all on one guy, Nathaniel Hackett. Gone. You know, I, I think, yeah, I, I I half jokingly tweeted yesterday after one of the debacles. It was, I think it was the, well, I tweeted, would you fight, would you consider firing Nathaniel Hackett after two games? And a couple people in like the sports betting and analytic world that I'm friends with responded, not joking. Yes, I would. Yes, this is, it is the things he's doing are not like, oh, you fix it for week three. He can't process the speed of calling plays and situational things and clock management. So yesterday, mind you, this is a week after yes. they passed on a fourth Correct. and five with one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL to kick a 64 yard field goal in Seattle, sort of like windy Seattle. Only two guys have ever made that field goal in NFL history. And they said, no, this is, and then he doubled down after the game too. No, I would do it again. Okay, guy, why don't you pump the brakes? So now we're back at altitude here. We're in Denver for week two, where you actually can make 60-yard field goals, and it's it's kind of like kicking a 52-yard field goal. And uh, I think they were they were lined up. They were trying to line up for a 54-yard field goal, but he was indecisive about whether to go for it or not. So he didn't run the field goal team out until there was like 13 seconds left on the play clock, and they're scrambling, and they actually somehow got the snap off right before the play clock expired. And McManus drills it right between the up, if I'm remembering correctly. But Hackett panicked and called timeout because he saw the play clock running down. Didn't get the timeout off in time. Right. Took a so penalty. actually, you know, I'm wrong then. It was a delay of game because they didn't yes. get they they barely didn't get it off. Yes. So they move him back to 59 yards. Okay, well, you know, you trusted him to kick a 64 yarder, not at altitude. Now it's a 59 yarder at altitude, and he's like, now nah, now we're gonna run the punt team out. <laughs> Dude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my God. Against the Houston bleeping Texans. Amazing. They are going to get drilled by teams. Well, but this is where I think, see, Russell Wilson spent so long kind of under the thumb of Pete Carroll, and he he led in his own way, but he also, because, you know, he won the Super Bowl when he was this young quarterback that was kind of along for the ride with a great defense, and he was managing, and I wonder, like, that dynamic, I think he wanted to get out from underneath. He wanted to be more of an owner of, the offense and the team, but he's been in sort of half deferral mode throughout his entire career. And I wonder, and he looks like he's, he's a very like affable kind of agreeable guy is a leader when he needs to be, he's going to need to take the reins on this like Peyton Manning did 10 years ago. And I'm shocked. He, I'm shocked. He didn't yesterday. I'm no. shocked. He didn't. We guys, th this is, this is my, listen, guys, I know what I'm doing. Nathaniel, maybe at some point you will, but you're new to this. Go take I've seat. got this covered. Yeah. So, and I, I believe uh, they are slated for a Sunday night appearance next week. So basically, the the reason why he very well might not make it is two of your first three games because Russ is there, national TV, right? Mm -hmm. So like his flaws are going to be exposed in single games. Because like yesterday he could sort of fit in. Hey, it's the Texans. Oh, what's going on in Denver, right? He is going to have two of his first three games with everybody watching him actively screw up. 
I know that football is so complicated. You can't just like remove a coach and then bring a new coach in. You can't like install a new system midseason. You have to keep you have to keep running the things you've been practicing for six months in the offseason. But just from a leadership standpoint, cool, keep the scheme the same and change it next year. There was a guy doing TV on Fox yesterday during the pregame who's made it widely known that he is not done coaching. And everyone keeps talking about the Cowboys as a destination. Sean Payton to the Broncos would make maybe even more sense. If you're Sean Payton, would you rather spend the next five years working with Dak Prescott, who's fine, or with Russell Wilson, who's maybe not Patrick Mahomes, but he's better than Dak Prescott? And if you, and again, this is crazy, but if Hackett again on national TV looks totally unprepared to be a head coach, I don't think any owner would eat the multi year guarantee contract he probably signed. But if Sean Payton and his agent back channeled and said, you know, he's got the itch again, you'd have to trade yeah. for him, I think, because I think the Saints still have his rights. But man, yep. how could you not be looking over there saying, God, if we only had a guy that knew what he was doing? Mm. At the very, very least, if I own the Broncos, I believe Hackett is calling plays too. I go and say, who's your best friend in the entire world who knows you inside and out as far as play play calling goes? He's calling plays next week. Like to have this guy trying to manage the clock and play, it's just, it's a debacle. It's not going to work. He can't Um, process. My next statement is brought to us by Judd's weight loss journey. 40 pounds, kept it off over a year now. Yep, that's exactly right. And that, that, of course, is thanks to, as I've been talking about for a long time now, my friends at Livia Weight Control Centers. That's right. It's not a diet place. It's weight control. And and folks, in the last, I don't know, month or, or, or so, right, Phil, we have gotten note after note and comments about folks who have joined the program and lost weight and are saying, you know what, Judd, first of all, if you can do it, I can. And they're exactly right. And second of all, it works. It's simple. And right now, if you join, your first eight weeks are free. That's right. Lose all the weight that you can for eight weeks. You're going to be feeling great. 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A. Livia, L-I-V-E-A dot com. Join the growing list of folks who have found out that weight control is possible with our friends at Livia, L-I-V-E-A dot com. All right, my next statement here. God, there's so much. We need like four hours to dissect everything that happened yesterday. (laughs) Red Zone. So. Um, I think my next statement is, despite everything we just said, I, I understand the shot that Denver took with Hackett, which is get an offensive-minded guy in here. They're, you're not going to bat a thousand. Hell, he was a finalist for the Vikings' job. The Vikings dodged a freaking bullet with Nathaniel Hackett. So, but my, but despite that, my statement is, having an offensive mastermind head coach is getting close to being a prerequisite in the NFL. Again, not all of them work, but yesterday. One of the most fun games we're going to see all season happened in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh. I believe. Or was it in Miami? Baltimore. It was Baltimore. in Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah. Oh. The Baltimore Ravens had a three-touchdown lead at the end of the third quarter. And then Tua unleashed to Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell. The Dolphins come all the way back, 42-38. to 38. Tua who I think I feel I feel like people were just like unnecessarily dumping on him. We you know, we didn't really get a chance to see him with great offensive minded coach, weapons, everything. And it's only been two games, but oh my god. He leads the NFL in passing guards through two games, in part because he threw for four hundred and sixty nine of them yesterday. Six touchdowns and a game winner in the final minute. Tyreek Hill, eleven catches for a buck ninety and two touchdowns. Jalen Waddle, eleven catches for a buck seventy-one and two touchdowns. That's absurd. Mike McDaniel, take a bow. Who knows? The wheels could come off, but the Dolphins are one of the most fun teams to watch in the NFL, and it's because they have put an offensive mastermind next to weapons and an accurate quarterback. Sounds down, familiar, by the way. Sounds down familiar. by three scores going into the fourth quarter. Down by three scores on the road. That, my friends, is why I love sports. Lamar Jackson, too, was amazing. He had 318 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. He ran for, he had a 75 yard rushing touchdown, too, ran for a buck 19 touchdown, and lost. Mm -hmm. Needs a contract, by the way.
get that guy contract. I do love me some Mike McDaniel. I, lo- mm. I love just a, a nerdy, weird guy just taking the bulls by the horns and, and getting those fins swimming. Big fan after, of it. After the game, Tyree Kill did a, one of the on-field post-game interviews with, uh, I think it was for, with uh, Kimberly Martin from ESPN. And she asked him some question, and he goes, listen, he grabs the mic. He's like, don't even, you don't even ask me questions. I'm just going to talk. And he just starts saying, Mike McDaniel, Tua, they both going to need a wheelbarrow of cash after this season's over. Just like, just pumping their tires. And people laughed. You know, he made all the comparisons and said, I know I played with Patrick Mahomes, but Tua is more accurate. Tua is this, that. I mean, I think everyone would take Patrick Mahomes, but people kind of laughed at Tua. Come on, man. There's there's no way. But he looks really good in the first couple of games. There's a reason why he was such a highly touted player coming out of college. So. Big fans. Yeah, let's go. All right. My next statement is I do not miss Kevin Stefanski. Mm, so I understand wow. that the Browns, more the piece of pie of the blame of the Browns' demise right now, or just in general vibe, is more on the ownership and the general manager than it is on Kevin Stefanski. He's the head coach. He's not the one who's actively probably trading for Deshaun Watson, but he's still the face of the team. And yesterday, the Browns have a two-touchdown lead against the lowly New York Jets, and they allow the Jets to come back with a 99.9% chance to win the game under two minutes to go, and that honestly just comes down to coaching. Um, Look, the the Browns two years ago were a play away from being to the AFC title game. Chad Henney had to come in for the Chiefs on five wide on fourth down and basically ice that game, which is still one of the most stone-cold moves I've ever seen Andy Reid do with a backup QB putting in him in for five wide on fourth down. But when I'm looking at the Browns and Kevin Stefanski, and, and look, he was a valiant soldier for the Vikings for years and kind of got buried behind the shuffle and rightfully so got a head coaching gig. He was qualified to get one. But I'm just looking at that Browns team and just how this, how sour things were with Baker last year. At the end of the day, like the image kind of does fall on the head coach and how he handles all of that. And yesterday's collapse was kind of just, it, it feels more like classic Cleveland Browns, right? Like it looked like they finally turned things around two years ago. And now with the Deshaun stuff lingering over them, their management's being buffoons and trying to walk the line during those press conferences. It's it's classic Cleveland. And I don't miss Kevin Stefanski. And I'm glad the Vikings have Kevin O'Connell. Wow. You're, <laughs> we should bring back Declan wants someone's ass fired. He's fired. Good. So we're doing Love it on, it. on Purple Daily with with Boone, Trenches with Boone. Old, old Macadac is firing people's asses every week. I think on Mackie and Judd, we need Declan to fire someone's ass every single week. I can Love do that. It. Let's bring it let's bring it back maybe sometime this week. Um I feel like I don't know, man. I, I, I'm still I'm still in on Kevin Stefanski as a coach. They're just this is a season where they had to rip the Baker Band-Aid off, and now they're going with a backup quarterback for the year. And I get everything you said. They allowed the Jets to come all the way back. But I'd like to see that product with Kevin Stefanski with an actual legitimate top 10 quarterback, which I think Deshaun Watson is. So I'm, I'm going to wait to bury Stefanski until we see him with Deshaun Watson. We might not get to see a lot of that until next year because, like, he's not coming back until December, for God's sake. So, But that was bad. That was definitely right. Joe Flacco lighting you up for 304 yeah. touchdowns. My well, that, goodness. That last drive was incredible. <laughs> like the Browns Joe absolutely Flacco. folded. Joe that Flacco. Not a good is Joe Flacco Joe elite? Wins. Coming up next. 651 646. Uh, the answer remains no, but that's fine. He was elite once, and it, it was during a playoff run. God bless him. Uh, Jed, any other, any other statements here? Yeah. Yes, yes. To... Uh, my next statement is this. This is why you put up with malcontents. I'm talking about what transpired in Vegas between the Raiders and Cardinals and Kyler Murray, who it does sound like there's a lot of just sort of sketchy stuff about him as a teammate and, you know, does he watch film and blah, blah, blah. Um, and he certainly has seemed to turn more sour in the last year or so. But all of that being said, if you watch that game and that comeback by the Cardinals, it was powered by one guy. Kyler Murray's legs and athletic ability and and his ability to change that game because of that was absolutely off the charts. There are quarterbacks who can do that, but it's a small list. And and there was I think it was the tying touchdown. I believe that the that the statistics on that were were I think he ran officially like I don't know 12 yards or something. But anyway, he ran 80 yards total. and it, 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 That was a two-point conversion to bring him within. Okay, two-point conversion. Eight, I believe, yeah. And and he had the ball in his hand navigating the field for 20-plus seconds. 
which is unheard of, damn near impossible. Yeah. But what he did yesterday is why you at least put up with the crap because there is, again, probably right now, might be a handful of quarterbacks in this league who can do that. And with that team, it had to be him. Like, like it wasn't like he was ignoring great play. Oh, you know, yeah. Larry Fitzgerald was open. No, he's retired now. So anyway, this is why you put up with the crap to try and find a quarterback who can do things like that. You know, I got into a little debate on Twitter yesterday. Shocking, I know, with a number one Kirk Cousins fan, our guy Joe Spinoza, who we've had on Purple Daily before oh. to defend the honor of of oh. Kirk Cousins. And earlier in the offseason, I put together my quarterback rankings. I think I had Kirk 14th. I had Kyler 10th. And then Lamar was like 11th or something. There's kind of a hodgepodge of guys between 8th and 14th that, you know, the gap isn't that wide. You could probably make a case any given Sunday. And uh, and Joe Spinoza came out yesterday and said, for anyone who thought that Kyler Murray was better than Kirk Cousins, come on now. Like, is it not obvious now? And I said, that's not. it's not an absurd take to say that Kirk is a better quarterback than Kyler Murray. I think it's obvious Kirk is more obsessive with preparation, certainly shows up on Sunday. I mean, Kirk is just very much more diligent prepared quarterback. The fact that they had to put a clause in Kyler Murray's contract to get him to watch film is a big red flag. But then you watch the end of that game that you just described where, all right, you're down by 16 points with whatever, a quarter to play, and everything's kind of going haywire, and you just need a guy to bring you all the way back and take over the entire game and convert two-point conversions, etc., and that natural ability is why Kyler Murray is still a measurably better quarterback the last couple of years than Kirk. Now, Kyler stock falling because of weird chemistry issues, just the, the vibe seems weird. Kirk stock rising because of Kevin O'Connell and the vibe being different in Minnesota. Yeah, could I see at the end of the year people largely putting Kirk above Kyler Murray in their meaningless quarterback rankings? Yes, but the end of that game is why you still say, oh my God. Yep. Look what that dude can do on a football field. So, uh, Dex, any other football statements from you here before we turn the page? No, I'm uh, I'm good to go. You can check out uh, okay. Purple Daily's YouTube page. Though realistic, Randy and I talked about uh, Kirk Cousins kind of shedding some mold and kind of kind of proving some haters wrong and seeing if he can kind of rise up and and kind of change the perception of him. We talked about obviously Kyler Murray right there. Can we can we move Kirk? Can Kirk allow himself to be put in the next echelon? It's on the Purple Daily YouTube channel. It's a pretty good combo. Also, so that's that's a great conversation. Uh, we dug up, too, for a Purple Rewind episode that was posted yesterday. We found the first hour of the Mackey and Judd show from March 16th, 2018, where we reacted to the signing of Kirk Cousins and everything. You can hear our first impressions of the signing and see how much we've changed or not or how wrong or right we were. Find that on the Purple Daily YouTube page and podcast feed as well.